Okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, people here in this room in Mark Pavilion, but uh, I hope much larger audience in uh, virtual space because we are streaming uh, this event live and instead uh, uh, will be available for other viewers uh, anytime uh, in the future. So uh, uh, the event is uh, called uh, Conceptualizing a Democratic Cuba, the Legal Dimensions of Transition. Uh, this is uh, part of uh, our uh, program here at FIU, WhatsApp Havel program for human rights and uh, diplomacy. My name is uh, Martin Palouš, uh, and I'm director of uh, this program for a couple of years. I teach here at FIU, uh, as I say, a class with a long name, Democracy and Human Rights, Basic Ideas and Concepts in Historical <coughs> Context. So then we start way back in the past, but we go to contemporary issues, and Cuba is certainly one of the topics uh, uh, of our uh, discussions. But not only discussions, I would say, contained in ivory tower of uh, uh, academia uh, at university, but certainly uh, democracy and human rights always reach out to the real world out there. Uh, and if I say Cuba, I uh, certainly don't need to uh, tell more to people informed. Cuban problem, Cuban question, more than six decades of dictatorship, and ongoing and maybe now intensifying discussions uh, concerning possible of Cuban transition. Uh, we have a special um, section uh, in our activities uh, 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 within our <coughs> program for human rights and diplomacy at FIU. It is a cooperation uh, with uh, uh, several uh, entities uh, uh, and especially with Ideas for Cuba uh, that is part of a problem of Cuban uh, Foundation here uh, in uh, Miami, led uh, by uh, Marcel uh, Felipe. Uh, we are trying uh, really to uh, promote a dialogue uh, that is not only uh, among observers, but also practitioners, people who are themselves seeking uh, uh, the way how they can contribute to successful transition from dictatorship, totalitarianism uh, to democracy. And certainly, uh, uh, legal discussion is extremely important uh, part of that. We have commissioned a couple of uh, papers uh, in the past year. Uh, now they are in form of uh, white papers available uh, on internet. Uh, we still have some printed copies, so maybe we can print more. And uh, I will read the titles, Constitutional Consideration for a Free Cuba, Judicial Independence in Civil and Common Law System. One of the authors, uh, Jeffrey Scott Shapiro, here is with us. He's an attorney at law and also investigative uh, journalist. So he has certainly uh, multiple and very interesting perspectives. The second paper which we'll be discussing today is uh, uh, the Cuba Demanda Project, Legal Avenues for a Transition to Democracy in Cuba. Uh, both authors are here. Uh, Santiago Alpizar, he is here uh, um, yeah, uh, among the panelists. But also Arnaldo Fernandez is in the audience, and uh, he also needs to be recognized because he's a contributor to this paper. Uh, so we will have these uh, two papers here. But uh, last but not least, we have another participant, uh, Daniel Pedreira, <coughs> who very recently defended very successfully his PhD thesis at, here at FIU. And he is going to be around at FIU in the years to come. And his PhD thesis was focused on the Cuban Constitution 1940. He's not a lawyer, uh, he's a political scientist, so he will bring a slightly different <coughs> perspective uh, to the discussion. But on top of that, uh, Daniel is now also involved in ongoing discussions among uh, Cuban activists here, well connected also with people on the island, how uh, we can improve the discussion so that arguments 
uh, put on the table are uh, realistic, uh, beefed by historical experience, and open uh, to uh, toward the future. So I think that we have uh, here uh, a very uh, interesting uh, starting point. So once more, welcome uh, to everybody. I only can add, uh, as a non-Cuban, uh, I have imposed certain limitations on myself, which means non-Cubans should not interfere into domestic <laughs> matters of Cubans. Uh, Cubans themselves uh, ha should have a full right, not just those people in power, to decide about the future of Cuba. So we have here uh, at least two Cubans in this moment, and uh, uh, certainly we will listen to their arguments in this particular context uh, very attentively. I myself published uh, another white paper, Cuba in 2021, a center European point of view. Uh, so certainly you can uh, check out also this paper and find out whether uh, arguments uh, from a center European perspective have certain value uh, in contemporary current discussions. Uh, so uh, that's for my introduction. And let's start with the panel, with the panelists. And I will ask uh, uh, Jeff to start. He's on next to me. And uh, he has uh, submitted a great paper. So welcome. thank you. So I'll just tell you a little bit about this paper and, and how we decided to move forward with it. We were charged with sort of the task of trying to figure out how could Cuba move forward to a new constitutional model and legal system if there were a democratic transition. And uh, as an American lawyer, of course, I was interested in looking at the American legal system because I think it is a fantastic system. I think it's the greatest system in the world. But of course, you cannot necessarily transition one system over to any other kind of system uh, smoothly without looking at all of the different ramifications. And so what I decided to do was uh, we decided to look at the history of law throughout the world, trying to understand the different models that were available. And we went as far back as the beginning of uh, Roman jurisprudence as far as 449 BC, which was a really interesting academic exercise to go all the way back and start looking at the beginning of law. Of course, if you really want to go far back, you can go as far back as ancient Egypt. There's some really interested uh, ways of viewing the law, if you go that far back, in the, the very foundations of uh, the Ten Commandments and the Torah. But we started with Roman jurisprudence in 449 BC. We moved up through the Roman Republic where people had started to finally get rights. We took you through the Roman Empire, through canon law, through the Holy Roman Empire. And then we moved forward into the realm of what happened in England with the establishment of the concept of uh, judicial review. And uh, this was very interesting, of course, because uh, judicial review is very different than uh, the system that is used by most countries throughout the world, which have applied a series of codes. And eventually, we take you through uh, the establishment of codes, both Spanish military codes and Napoleonic code. And we talk about the distinctions between code and the idea of judicial review, which establishes the principle of stare decisis, which is case law. So in the United States, of course, we have followed the British model of judicial review. And what that means is even though we have codes, we have US federal codes and we have state laws, we also have judicial review. So if a court decides to rule on a case, they can further narrow or further describe what the words in that code actually mean. So even though we have a First Amendment that says free speech, what does free speech actually mean? Well, there's a whole course I took at University of Florida called First Amendment Law, and we studied over 100 Supreme Court cases that narrowly define those two words, free speech. And there are many more. So judicial review has its simplicity, but it also has its complexity. We then started to move into the history of <coughs> Cuba, and we looked at the implementation of Spanish Civil Code, uh, which had gotten implemented in the late 1880s. And then um, we talked about how its first constitution was established uh, just after the turn of the century. We finally uh, moved up to the Constitution of 1940, which is where things get really interesting, because this is when you finally get to see Cuba have a truly 
democratic constitution that is very similar to our own, that provides a lot of the basic civil liberties and freedoms that we have here in the United States. And uh, it was generally a good constitution. Uh, it had been passed just four years after the 1936 Soviet constitution, which is kind of interesting because eventually the Soviet constitution will serve as the influence for what replaces the 1940 constitution in Cuba in 1976. Um, 12 years after the 1940 constitution is passed, uh, General Batista will take control and he will suspend civil liberties in that constitution. And after he takes control in 1959 and, and promises to restore those civil liberties, he never does. Uh, Cuban society goes for many years, almost two decades, without a new constitution under the communist regime. Fidel Castro does everything he can to discourage people from going to law school. He directs people to other professions because he doesn't really want people mastering the concept of the law or understanding legal principles. Yep. One of the reasons I think you have in Cuba so many uh, mathematicians and physicists and scientists, very intelligent people, but he tried to keep people away from the legal profession. And eventually when he did open it back up, he made sure that there were people who were only loyal to him and the <laughs> Communist Party. So in 1976, finally Cuba establishes its first uh, post-revolutionary constitution, which is a Soviet-style constitution, which has in it Article 5 that says that the uh, Communist Party of Cuba is the vanguard of the socialist state and everything revolves around that. It also had something in it, Article 62, which said that even though there were freedoms provided by the Constitution, they were always meant to be consistent with the socialist state. So you could say what you wanted as long as it didn't contradict anything that was against the socialist state or the regime. Meaning at the end, Article 5, the Communist Party rules everything. So that constitution remained intact until about 2018, Raul Castro decided to form a committee to try to redraft a new constitution, which was enacted in 2019. And this constitution, despite a lot of the talk that it was gonna be different and it was gonna be progressive and move things into the future for freedom, it was very similar to the 1976 constitution. In some ways, it was even harsher. There were things in both constitutions that were contradictory that would say everyone was guaranteed a free education, but then in terms of going to college or a university, it was only open to revolutionaries. So we took you through this whole journey to try to understand the history of Cuba's legal foundations, its constitutions, and then we came to the conclusion at the end that if there were to be a democratic transition in Cuba, as attractive as judicial review might be, because it gives courts some power to look into the meaning and the legislative intent of what is passed by a national assembly or a parliament or a congress, we decided that the best model for Cuba would be the one that is actually in the 1940 Constitution, which is based more off the European system of having what's called a constitutional court. This is a court that is available to review the constitutionality and legality of different laws that are passed. So if a citizen or citizens under a referendum want to challenge the constitutionality or the fairness of a law, they have an alternative to go to, and you don't have a system of legislative supremacy or executive supremacy where the state is simply passing a law and there's no recourse. So that was the conclusion we came to for Cuba that a constitutional court that would allow the people to contest unfair laws was uh, the practical solution. And uh, at this point, we feel very confident that if there was a democratic transition in Cuba, uh, at least temporarily enacting the constitution of 1940 and assessing a constitutional court would be a practical solution to move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions uh, in my mind right away, uh, but uh, let's uh, first go to Santiago Alpizar, Cuba de Manda, uh, because I guess that uh, we might uh, hear now slightly different perspective, but the same orientation. Uh, thank you, Martin. Well, my name is Santiago Alpizar, and I co-author this uh, paper alongside with my friend and colleague from Cuba, Arnaldo Fernandez, who was initially a scientific. He, he didn't study law the first time. He studied physics in Germany and then become a lawyer back in Cuba. And we worked together. We were fighting each other <laughs> in, uh, in tribunal a couple of times. And um, I'm glad, I'm glad to uh, bring him along on this uh, uh, endeavor of Cuba Demanda and uh, this paper that we were pro with uh, pretty much his influence in how to understand the, uh, the process of coming from the law to the law to a new law, which is the principle of the stare decisis. 
That's the reason why uh, uh, we find that fundamentally disagree with the notion that we have to get back to the 1940 Constitution, which, by the way, I say many times, I don't like it because it's so instrumental. I think it's a very inspirational uh, constitutional. It's a very ins uh, inspirational, especially in the way it was created, the way that the Q1 come together in 1940s and discuss a new way to go forward and implement a democratic, a democratic process in Cuba. That one is uh, the value of the Constitution. Uh, I think otherwise, the, as a legal instrument, it's, it was so regulatory. It was a bylaw rather than a Constitution, and that's the reason why I don't like it. And I believe that one is the reason why uh, it was eventually uh, derogated, terminated, canceled, whatever you want to say, by the prior uh, dictatorship in Cuba. What we are using now, uh, our, our uh, process of interpretation, <coughs> is to use whatever we have. We were a lawyer in Cuba. We were, we were litigators in Cuba. And we know that we can escort things against the government using the current law. We did. And, um, and in different process, uh, the eminent, uh, eminent domain cases uh, where I, I acting as a lawyer defending people who were being expropriated, and we won eventually a case against the government. We stop sometimes the the uh, revolution place or plaza where Castro once fell and broke his knee. I remember that when we was in the construction of that place, a, a guy came to me and said, I need you to help me out because this guy want me to surrender my beautiful resident of five bedroom, three uh, uh, bathroom, and in a chain they're giving just a, a small apartment uh, in the uh, obscure of the city of Santa Clara, very small apartment in a place where it's called Indaya. Indaya I mean, is a derogative name for a place where no one wants to live. And uh, we won the case with, uh, through a stipulation with the government. They uh, realized that they were abusing Bijon and unconscious uh, <clears throat> uh, on this guy. And they give uh, whatever he, he wanted, a, a very nice uh, house that was appropriated to the other guy who came to the United States in a, in a close, uh, a very close uh, uh, situated where the place of this person was living. So based on these few experience, there are some others where we uh, found a way to uh, implement the reasoning and the, uh, the basic uh, fundamental uh, uh, law on property rights, on uh, liberty rights, or life rights of the individual that we think we can change because otherwise we are going to interrupt the, uh, the continuity of what we have, the, uh, of what we consider the law of the land uh, in Cuba. So this current reconstitution of the Communist Party, that's what we call, we still find uh, places and ways to um, enforce the individual rights in Cuba. Uh, we are, uh, through the paper described, so many things that we can do through the criminal procedures, the civil law procedures, to implement whatever the, the this reconstitution of the Communist Party said. The first article of the Constitution of this one that we are, uh, we were in disagree, of course. We were fighting in that, in, back in 1999 to people say no to the Constitution, to uh, mandate the Cuban government to actually uh, uh, Call all the Cuban people, all the uh, uh, the watchers of the Cuban uh, community, to go in, in whatever happened back in 1940 in the constitutional uh, reunion or meeting to redraft a, a good constitution for the Cuban <coughs> people. But we fell in that process, and we had this uh, this new constitution. But still, we think that using the Article One, with the, where it say that the Cuban is to for all Cubans which is uh, the thought of our national hero, Jose Martí, that the Cuban is for all Cubans. That's the first article of this constitution. At the article 78, which is, uh, is uh, an explanation of the consumer rights in Cuba, 
or these two articles, we do so many things inside Communist Cuba to the point that we bring to, to the point to us surrender the communist regime. And what we need to do is to judicialize all issues of the opposition in Cuba using the current law in Cuba. Otherwise, we can never have the support or the uh, fully support of the United States that we have, of course, through the people like you, my friend, or people the government, of course, and our legislature. But we, we need inside Cuba a state our claims. Because otherwise, nobody going to listen to us. That's the reason why we came, uh, we went to uh, recently to Europe to reunite all these people <coughs> in the exile to fight not only outside, but inside Cuba, using the current law to present our care for democracy and liberty. Santiago, thank you very much. And now, uh, Daniel uh, Pedreira. Uh, as I've said, he's a lawyer, but he is a great expert in the Constitution 1940 because he studied the context very carefully, uh, and he is the voice of FIU. So, Daniel, what to say to what you have heard so far? Well, I, I read both, both um, uh, papers and thought they were very thought out and very detailed, and, yeah. and, and that's what you need. And you actually need this discussion between two two different positions um, because, you know, at the end of the day, the legal system is the backbone of any society, especially in a democracy. And if that's what you want, you need a strong basis, a legal basis for for everything that comes from it. So, so this discussion is very important. Um, I I I guess I'll talk to one paper and then the other, and then we'll see. Um, so, the, so going um, with the first paper, um, I, I like that historical um, background, because I think in this discussion on Cuba, we focus a lot on Cuban law historically, and maybe a little bit of Spanish law, but not much beyond that. So it's a good, um, it's a good way to show what else is out there and why it may or may not work. So it, I don't think you're necessarily saying, you know, the common law is the, the system for, for Cuba, but you're saying it also exists and it has these, these benefits and, and it's worked here and it may or may not in Cuba. And you, you also mention about how it's hard to change radically from one system to another, particularly in a system, in, in, a, in a period of transition. Um, which is very dynamic and, and very, you have to kind of keep, keep up in order to, to not let the transition fail. But I think it was a good exercise in, in kind of putting that forward and, and showing the alternative. Um, the other paper uh, was also good. I, I think it's, m it's more pre-transition. I think it's things that can happen now is Correctly. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I agree that the, uh, you know, the Cuban people should use whatever tool at their disposal to, um, to kind of reclaim their rights and to, to enforce their rights. What I, and maybe you can address this, um, but what I see with that is that while it may work sometimes, there's, there's a very marked difference between de facto and de jure in, in Cuba. Um, so you have laws on paper, but if the law doesn't fit the system, then the system will just change it or violate it and not care. Um, you know, you, you've had all these legal um, modifications recently, even after the Constitution was approved, right. to kind of adjust to repressing not only print material and, and spoken material or, or sound material, but internet material. To, to adjust with the times. Mm -hmm. And you, you have a new penal code after the, the protests of July 11th. So, so it, the, the system is, is they, might, they might give you a win here, but then so that it doesn't happen the next time, they'll try to one up the, so it's, it's a constant game. So that's kind of what, where I see the shortcoming of it. So may, but maybe you can address it, <clears throat> and, and maybe it's, it's something that can be fixed. Yep. Okay. Gentlemen, that was a great uh, start, and uh, let me first challenge you for my uh, Central European perspective. Uh, 
many people very often say that Cuba should uh, also uh, seek uh, kind of inspiration in uh, successful revolutions in uh, our part of the world. 1998, this um, uh, year of miracles when communism disappeared uh, from uh, Central Europe. Uh, our legal tradition is a typical continental tradition, so we don't have much uh, sensitivity for a started a thesis uh, principle. Uh, and uh, I remember, or I read uh, very attentively, what lawyers were uh, saying in the very beginning of our modern legal tradition when Czechoslovak state was coming into existence after the Austrian-Hungarian Empire dismembered uh, as a result of the First World War. Uh, they were uh, normativists, uh, uh, which means that they believe that uh, 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 law, the system of law, is a system of norms well organized uh, based on what they called the Grundnorme, uh, the fundamental uh, law, let's say, material basis of a constitution. But when Czechoslovakia was coming into existence, uh, they were using the concept of legal revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, legal revolution has nothing to do with ideological versions of revolutions. Uh, it is, a, as they uh, say it, very formal concept. Discontinuity of the law moments uh, uh, when uh, the old uh, Roman principle, uh, lex posterior uh, der derogat priori, only if it's a new norm, uh, the old one is abrogated, uh, <coughs> cannot be used. So what you first uh, need to say, which laws uh, are still staying in place, uh, you are not starting from zero, you are starting some legal process with uh, the view of this discontinuity. So the question is, what was happening after 1989? Uh, well, that revolution was a revolution on the streets and then some sort of uh, communication, negotiation with people in power, and they were affected by the international situation uh, so that they were more uh, open uh, to these type of discussions. If Gorbachev had not been in Moscow, and Reagan, obviously, in Washington, this would not have uh, taken place, just to be very clear. The first thing uh, legally that happened was uh, the two articles were removed from the Constitution, one and four. The same uh, thing what you have said, a leading role of the Communist Party. But besides that, uh, all uh, laws were in power. Václav Havel was elected president uh, of uh, Czechoslovakia uh, in this uh, older, uh, um, uh, an old uh, legal context that uh, showed a lot of uh, elements of continuity. So what I'm telling you is that we had some sort of strange mixture. This is something what I, I think I would tell to those who believe in Constitution of 1940. Can you really go back in time? Uh, uh, can you step twice into uh, one and the same river as all Heraclitus asked? So there is something uh, uh, dubious about uh, this belief and this operation. But I'm not against it. I'm only saying that it's dubious. And in the next year, in Czechoslovakia, 1990, first uh, they were uh, agreed uh, principles of co-optation of new members to uh, parliament. I became one of them. Then uh, a law on political parties, election law, uh, important decisions, do you want proportional or majority uh, system, and so on and so forth. Only a year later, after uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms uh, was uh, integrated into constitutional order by short constitutional law, uh, uh, and it was decisioned by parliamentarians that uh, were, uh, became members of parliament after the first free election, which means in January of 1991, our lawyers said that in this moment, uh, we have a new legal order. So we uh, spent a year in this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, transitional uh, phase. Uh, would this uh, be interesting, interesting uh, experience for Cubans? Because obviously, uh, I think that to remove the article concerning the leading role of the party is first step, it is must. But I agree with Daniel that 
formal removals of articles uh, still don't guarantee that reality is uh, uh, changing, uh, that people in power are like power, and uh, they need uh, to be in a certain state of mind just to start stepping out or yielding. Uh, so uh, tell me, uh, does this Central European experience uh, give you some uh, inspiration, or is it different world, uh, different times? I mean, I, I think, you know, when looking at the Cuban transition, when, once it happens and kind of preparing for that, the Czech example is one that's looked at very closely. So it does help give that, that perspective. Um, there are differences, and primarily cultural differences, um, not only in the Cuban tradition, but in the Latin American tradition more generally, um, that might make some things different. But I think there are commonalities as well with, uh, with you know, coming from a, a communist system that had you know laws inspired, the Cuban laws inspired on the Soviet laws and, and Eastern European laws. So, um, so I, I do think it's it's a helpful example of how things happened and and something to kind of keep in mind and and see where things were you know went right and maybe had some some missteps and how to kind of try to prevent that from from happening yeah well I basically agree with professor and you however we are we are now central European in Cuba we are Cubans and there is a big difference in the way we perceive and we do things in Cuba. I think uh, uh, what happened in Cuba after July 11 is the, the <coughs> old pact is any ever word between the Cuban people and the communist regime in Cuba was broken. It's broken. It's not, there is a new material constitution on the street of Cuba. This material constitution called for freedom and no more communists. These are the two words that people were yelling and, ch ch and chanting on July 11 and um, moving forward. Uh, that's the reason why uh, they are precipitating in Cuba, the communist regime, and changing every law according to the reconstitution. I still believe we're using this law, the new coming, and the one in place and the constitution we need to use this as a tool of the change of the transition <coughs> that is, tra is happening now in Cuba. It's happening when they reinstitute the communist, uh, this new common uh, <coughs> constitution and it's pushing forward after July 11. And we have to take uh, all this factor in consideration to help our people in Cuba to understand that a common claim uh, needs to be filed before the tribunal for the, the, the uh, uh, revolutionary uh, law, or law or revolution of the law, as a Kelsen said, happens in Cuba. It's important for me, and uh, we need to exchange our force. We need to unite in the purposes to help our people inside Cuba to push that claim for liberty, life, and property, and be do the same outside here in the United States and the, tra uh, the trans uh, transatlantic uh, relation with Europe. That's what we need to do, okay. using the current law. We need to use it because the, we don't have nothing else. I think you could do it either way, depending on which direction the Cuban people wanted to go. I think the important Correct. part of what we were really trying to assert was that there, there does need to be a judicial power. You can't have the situation that you have right now in Cuba where you have this unitary system where you have a judicial branch that is deferential <laughs> to another branch. Yeah. And you actually have that throughout the world. There are very few countries where you have a co-equal judicial branch. A lot of people <coughs> don't realize that. Even in the United Kingdom, they have a system called legislative supremacy where the parliament is the final word. The courts defer to the parliament, not the other way around, which to me as an American is, is just a concept that is fundamentally at war with the Constitution of the United States, and it doesn't make any sense to me. But I think that there's gonna be a process. If you were to do it one way or the other, it's gonna be a different process. You could use the current law, and you could do what you were saying, Martin. You could simply remove Article 5. You could take out the concept of the right. uh, socialist state being the vanguard. You could remove uh, you know, what was in the 1976 Constitution equivalent of Article 62, saying that all freedoms are deferential to the socialist state, that kind of a thing. That is one way to do it. Um, I think your point, though, Martin, was very telling. You're talking about mindset. 
And when, you know, when the Nazis came into Germany, of course, they, they slowly Aryanized everything. They changed everything to become a Nazi state. And then when the United States came in and the Marshall Plan started and the Allies came in and liberated it, they denazified Europe. They made sure that there was a mindset that this regime was eradicated, it was gone. So if you're still using the legal document that was created by the Communist Party, there might be some resonating feelings there, right? There might be some confusion. There might be some feelings that we're still using the legal treatise that was created by the regime that oppressed us that we've now eradicated. Um, my biggest concern, I think, about starting out with stare decisis is the following. Of course, you have to start building case law, right? It took England hundreds of years. It took the United States hundreds of years to build a backlog of cases that you could have a common law system built. On. So where does that start? We don't want to start now because we have a communist system based on a legal system that is deferential to the Communist Party. Look at the legal system in Cuba and how it's set up. You have professional judges, which are the real judges that are lawyers that actually know the law. But those judges are actually flanked by what are called lay judges that are lo you know, loyal to the Communist Party. They come from workers' collectives. And they're really <coughs> sort of the equivalent of what the Soviet Union called the political officer. They're there to make sure that the judge votes the way the Communist Party wants them to vote. So we don't really want to look at any of the legal decisions that are being made now under the regime. We can't really use those going forward because those decisions are flawed. So you're going to have to start somewhere. So if you start with the constitutional court, and in the meantime, you are building new case law with a new set of judges that are not just lawyers who are accepted into local collectives or bar associations that are approved by the Communist Party, eventually you will have judges that are making decisions based on the right criteria. Right now, we don't even have the right judges in place. You don't even have judges that are thinking freely. They're basing all their decisions on what the Communist Party wants. So before you can even get to constitutional transition, before you can even get to building new case law, you have to have the right lawyers and the right, ju right judges in place to make those decisions. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, that's a good point, uh, the one that you are stretching now. Um, Cuba had a, a system, or we had it, a system of, of judicial review. And uh, it, to further that, uh, during the report this year, was instituted the, uh, the constitutional um, rule of the, of the Cuban Supreme Law. Now they are planning to do the same in Cuba. And uh, uh, there are many decisions of the Cuban Supreme uh, uh, Court back on the Republic year that is in place still in Cuba. There is a law still in Cuba. And um, especially one that I don't like it, the one that says that the revolution is a, is a, uh, the, the, uh, yeah. It's a source of law. It's a source of law. That's, that's a crazy thing. Uh, so I still believe that we still need, uh, still, creating a new case law in Cuba and decision that will help us to build a new republic right now. <coughs> but if I may, uh, uh, Jeff Sorry, mentions uh, uh, freedom of expression uh, in uh, the, this uh, context, and it brings uh, uh, to my mind, my attention, a question of place of, uh, let's say, international law uh, and international principles uh, within a constitutional uh, legal order. In our case, uh, the process started in November of 1989, and as I've said, only in January of 1991, <coughs> which means 14 months later, uh, after a really material situation uh, has changed dramatically and people started to get used uh, to a new situation. They had to, uh, uh, they participated in elections. Uh, out of sudden, there was a free press and uh, free discussion. And uh, so in January of 1991, there was a short consti uh, constitutional law adopted uh, by the parliament uh, saying uh, that now a Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms is a material foundation of a constitution. And also, Article 10 uh, were put uh, uh, incorporated international conventions uh, uh, on, of human rights uh, into our uh, uh, constitutional system. And uh, this law said that all legal practices, provisions, laws, and everything that are not in conformity with these principles uh, uh, cease to be valid by December 31st that year. Uh, so there is a good question. How 
could we know <laughs> that this or that was uh, uh, in conformity or was not in conformity with these declared uh, legal principles? What I'm saying is that this is a place not only for the actions of courts and people uh, being able to uh, use uh, uh, to protect their, themselves um, against all, uh, I would say, uh, uh, injustices uh, committed on them, but it's also a place for human rights organizations, uh, for those who are able to study in concrete uh, uh, contexts how law is practiced uh, in a, a, a new state. Because you can expect a lot of confusions, uh, conflicts, uh, based by uh, the fact that people are not educated, uh, that they don't know what their rights are, and that you need to cultivate a certain discourse. Right. Cultivation. I like that word. Um, I like that word. Cultivate people, and uh, I. Uh, one of the things that we are stretching our paper, we say, uh, page four, our paper, economic rights and consumer protection actions in Cuba, based only on the the communist constitution, they recognize the use and judgment and free disposal of personal property, Article 58. We need to we need to strength the the people right to have this right guarantee through the judicial review in Cuba. Uh, adequate housing and safe, healthy <coughs> habitat, Article 71 of the Cuban uh, Constitution, <coughs> Communist Constitution. We need to also uh, address that one in our core quality of medical attention, <laughs> protection and recovery <coughs> services, Article 72. Quality education and services, which is uh, empower people to have the right to teach their children, whatever they want, including religions, use, and custom of the Cuban people. Quality, uh, I mean, healthy and balanced natural environment. <laughs> you know how, how polluted Cuba is. Access to portable water, Article 76. Helpful and adequate nutrition, Article 76. And this one is the uh, paramount. Quality consumer goods and services, Article 78. In a country where all services and, and, and products are provided by the, the government, we can uh, flaw the Cuban system of court with claim against product liability and everything that the government provides to the Cuban people that is totally corrupted and polluted and unhealthy. That one is the way to unconstruct communists. Um, no, I mean, I, I think I think that's a good um, approach to flood. I, I like that concept of flooding them with with just legal paperwork. Um, but I think you know, again, they're, it's, it would probably get to a point where they would they would find a way to like stop the flood, you know, um, change the law or something. I mean, it, it'd be interesting. I think. If you if you make a big deal about it and get enough attention, no. um, not only in Cuba but abroad uh, about it, and the fact that you know that's what they're doing, maybe you know that would be that would be interesting. Um, but yeah, that, that's exactly you know. that's exactly the point. By f f uh, Arnaldo, do you want to add something? I'm sorry. Yep. And for that, we only have two ways since 1956, borrowing Lincoln. Borrow or borrow? Borrow is out of the picture. Okay? We only got borrowers. So, to change everything, we need to change the powers and then the law. 
to, that's, yeah. But, but that seems uh, uh, strange for people in the time because the, the elections in Cuba are a quark. Use it. <laughs> Try to make them real. And that's the second part. Also. Is, Yes, um, I think if I can make just a, a clarification, I remember when I was discussing the electoral law back in 1987, that Castro, Fidel Castro was alive still, and recognized that that was a, a danger that they are facing, that people in, in, the, in the neighborhood election of, elector, of, of the electoral for the municipality assembly can elect anyone they want without being in the list of the Communist Party. And that, that eventually those guys can raise up to the National Assembly and pose a real opposition to the Communist Party. That's what uh, we are trying to estrange in our position that electoral law can be also used against the Communist Party. As, yeah. And he said, he, <laughs> Alea Hactaes, I remember that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, another question that I uh, have in my mind is the relation between international law and constitutional law. Because for our tradition from Charter 77, the uses of international law were uh, significant and important. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we all know that the relationship in traditional law inter gentes, uh, in the traditional uh, public international law and international human rights law is a very dynamic and it can sometimes uh, generate problems but sometimes opportunities uh, fighting uh, totalitarianism. Uh, Freedom of expression was mentioned here I cannot go into details, uh, but uh, obviously uh, this is a very dynamic uh, topic today. Uh, any transition, uh, uh, even in 1989 and now, is not taking place in a stable environment. It's uh, taking place against the environment that is a uh, context that is changing too. What I know about freedom of expression uh, in the European context, uh, this European uh, supervision, uh, everybody would say loud and clear, <coughs> freedom of expression is the absolute right. Uh, it uh, can be uh, restricted uh, with said, uh, there are some legitimate restrictions on uh, freedom of expression. But restrictions must be prescribed by a law, uh, must follow legitimate aim, and might be necessary in a democratic society. Uh, there is a principle of proportionality. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the big question is how a concrete system in transition can react uh, to somewhat, uh, sometimes very explosive questions uh, 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 connected with uh, uh, these, uh, 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 with uh, this situation. Take situation in the United States. You have those who uh, would be dying for gender rights and uh, rights on this side. They are more traditionalists. There are certain discussions concerning uh, um, uh, the uh, national interests, uh, interest of state that also should protect uh, itself, its uh, basic intentions against, I would say, uh, sometimes destructive um, uh, articulations of free expression. Uh, so uh, uh, how do you see uh, the human case exposed uh, to all these uh, questions that are certainly Cuban questions, but at the same time not only Cuban questions that can uh, make Cuba part of, uh, I would say, community of democratic nations or help uh, current leaders to keep uh, parties with uh, autocrats of today and uh, using uh, their arguments quite creatively and effectively. How Cuban Democrats can use uh, legal arguments uh, to uh, uh, get the freedom. I mean, I, I, 
You know, it's, it's a tough, I mean, I think a lot of that that you mentioned goes back to the law. So when you're talking about what is restricted speech, for example, or what, to what extent are rights restricted in the US, for example, and, and in any other country, that's a legal question. So, so really it's up to whatever legal body, whether it's a, it's a Supreme Court ultimately or an appeals court or whatever level, depending on where you are, it's up to them to determine based on the Constitution, based on precedent, if, if that's the basis, based on whatever is there, to, to say this is rightfully restricted or it's not, it's unconstitutional. So we're going, it's, it's kind of we're going back to the same question of you need that backbone, that legal backbone in order to be able to then address those questions. And, and so how, the question I guess is how do you address it with the system now? Because if you take out those articles that we were mentioning before of, you know, and basically not making the Communist Party the, the dominant force in, in the country and, and allowing for freedom of speech and, and freedom of expression and, and all that, then how, right, then how do you, how do you address those, those cases where there might be some issue where uh, it, it, there's a debate on whether, it, whether the speech is protected or not? And how do you determine those protections <coughs> as well? So, um, so yeah, I think that's also a consideration. It's not just the, the what laws you're gonna have, but then how how are you gonna apply them, or how 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 are you going to not apply them, but how how are you going to enforce them if if they if there's a, a conflict between the law and the reality on the ground, and and in a dynamic situation like we're expecting to see at some point, you know, in, in a transition period, like I mentioned, it's a very dynamic period with a lot of change, you're, you're gonna get those, those scenarios. So that's, that's a thing to also consider. What, Mr. Shapiro? Well, what I would say is, uh, first of all, this is an area I focus on a lot as an attorney. I was a prosecutor in Washington, D.C., and I uh, had a very unique job. My job was to prosecute uh, First Amendment related criminal offenses that were exceptions under the First Amendment. I prosecuted a lot of unlawful protesters actually at the U.S. Capitol and the White House. So when January 6th happened, I was writing some pieces for the Wall Street Journal about the dynamics of how that all falls together under the First Amendment. I also do legal review work for the Washington Times editorial board. And I can tell you that one way to view it, first of all, is let's get away from the word restricted. The words we actually use in the United States are protected and unprotected speech. Yeah. And the First Amendment protects most speech, but organically throughout time and throughout the process of judicial review and stare decisis, the courts started to realize there were certain things that simply didn't have protection, such as fraud, defamation, false advertising, child pornography, and uh, the incitement <coughs> of imminent and lawlessness. what about fighting words? Fighting words fall under incitement of imminent yeah. lawlessness. Yeah. That goes back to the Brandenburg case, and I think it was 1969, and that's really what would be applied to what happened on January 6th if you were trying to look at whether or not there was any incitement there or it was just a riot or some people have called it an insurrection, which I think is incorrect. <laughs> um, but I think when you view it through the lens of protected and unprotected speech, it's a little bit different because I think that when you have true free speech, you start out with a clean slate, the speech is considered free, and throughout time, the courts gradually figure out, okay, we're not going to protect all speech. We're not going to say that if someone threatens someone, if someone tries to make an imminent move of violence uh, against a temple or a church, we're going to protect that. We're not going to say all forms of expression, such as uh, child pornography, is going to be considered art or has literary value. So I think it's something that's going to arise organically over time. Right. Well, in, uh, in the case of Cuba, I think uh, uh, the court ring, again, Recon reconstitution, Article 56, call for the right for fundamental right of people to protest and manifest um, in the public place in Cuba. And in interesting enough, <laughs> the uh, this, uh, Supreme Court uh, president <coughs> of the Cuban uh, Supreme Court uh, president, Mr. Uh, Ruben Remigio Ferro, ratified and interpreted for everyone that article and say on July 24, 2021, that there was a fundamental right of people of Cuba to protest again, and that was not a crime. 
uh, to have a different thought about the Communist Party and the, the reason why they are empowered. For that reason, we uh, base in that uh, uh, interpretation, correct interpretation of the freedom of speech, the freedom of opinion, the freedom to protest, the fr Pacif uh, doing pacifically, which most of the people did in Cuba back on um, July 11th. And also because the President of the United States in, two, in 2021, February 26, issued what is called now the Khashoggi Ban, that called for reports uh, to the State Department to uh, obtain visa bans on individuals who <coughs> abuse other people's rights <coughs> in other countries. We had as a Cuba demand has reported 37, at least 37 prosecutors and judges that in Cuba judge and sentence to large years in prison people who pacifically protest in Cuba. I think what we need to do is to have so many things doing at the same time. No one thing will bring uh, uh, willing us to the victory against the Communist Party. There are so many things that we can do. We have to use to the law. We have to use this. We have to. We we need to use the street of our country, which is a public places, to protest, to bring down that the system of oppression and opprobrium, which is the Communist Party. It's in our national ethic. We cannot live under opprobrium system. It said it in the second strophe of our national ethic. I'm watching the time, we still have uh, 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 some space, so uh, is uh, there anyone from uh, the audience here who would like to step in or uh, raise a question? I don't see any, okay. Uh, well. I almost didn't come to this event because for, if I had a nickel for every time an event has had Cuban transition in the title, uh, I'd be a rich man. And so um, I almost didn't come, but I'm so glad that I did because I think the two doctores here have brought a, um, a new way, have recognized that Cuba is a country, that in every country there are um, structures of power that set up the rules of the game and that in those structures of power, you have to fight to change the rules of the game. I mean, it happens here in the United States. Yep. I mean, I wouldn't sell the United States model for very expensively yeah. right now. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I came. I'm, I'd like to read the paper, and um, I congratulate both of you for your, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good uh, encouragement. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. Look, uh, I think uh, that, uh, uh, and I uh, know this situation from our own historical experience, uh, it is extremely important uh, that revolutionaries, uh, people who really want to be engaged uh, in a change, uh, are capable of having effective, open dialogue, uh, not only among themselves, but with uh, all others, uh, around the world uh, because this dialogue uh, is a tremendous um, uh, help, I believe. Uh, I always say that Cuban question needs to be seen uh, in worldly terms, the old uh, wisdom of uh, first Czechoslovak president, founding father, Tomasz Garik Masaryk. The biggest problem of Cubans is uh, that uh, there are so many people of goodwill out there in the world, <coughs> they, don't know enough, they are not interested enough, they are not curious enough, uh, and uh, all these questions uh, have certain universal uh, value and taste, and there are no, uh, never, I would say, answers uh, given forever and that can be taken for granted. They always have to be tested against the reality in an open dialogue. This is the most important gift of free speech. Uh, and free expression, that people uh, can have a, a meaningful dialogue. Obviously, we always need to be aware of these restrictions, uh, rights of other people, uh, and many other legitimate aims uh, that uh, need to be respected. But uh, the dialogue needs to go on, uh, and I think that this is what are we having now today is maybe 
something with the history, but rather the beginning uh, than uh, the end. Uh, I agree that Cuba first need to make this first step <coughs> to get rid of totalitarianism, and uh, <coughs> then <coughs> free dialogue uh, can start to uh, be transformed into plans of transition. And you know, Martin, uh, what I would add to that is to get to that transition, one of the things we didn't talk about but we're talking about, in a very indirect way, is the criminalization of speech code. Right. Right? We're talking right. about criminalizing speech. And I think it's important, when we look at how to transition Cuba, we also look at the criminal justice system. I guess I take an interest in this because I did prosecutorial law in the United States, but a lot of countries in Europe, as you know, have a very different criminal justice system than the United States. The United States is actually very different, as I said before. A lot of countries don't even have the prohibition of double jeopardy. Mm -hmm. They have re-prosecution, okay? But Europe has used what's really kind of referred to as a collaborative or inquisitorial prosecutorial system where the government and the defense work together to supposedly find the truth. The United States has what's called an adversarial criminal justice system where the defense and prosecution go at one another. And I believe the United States has proven this system is much more effective in terms of preserving the rights of the individual. When you know that your own lawyer is collaborating with the state to find the truth, it doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence that you have a lot of protection. So I do think that going forward, one thing we could do to try to guarantee the rights of free speech in Cuba and make sure that things like Decree 349, right. uh, which is really the reverse of our right of freedom of assembly here in the United States, is to ensure that Cuba has an adversarial criminal justice system. I'd be curious to know what all of you think uh, of that. Uh, the, funny, the funny thing is we had in Cuba in place an adversary system. The, three, <laughs> the, the thing is there is no guarantee. I mean, the law <laughs> say one thing that they don't, they, they cannot guarantee that we have that system right. in place. I know because I was a lawyer in Cuba, a litigator, and I defended many people for 11 years in the court, in the penal uh, system <laughs> in Cuba. And... Uh, uh, it was very interesting, so many things, the pressure that I, I, I was placed in because the adversary system in Cuba allowed me to present uh, evidence right. against the government, call witnesses, made the position. They call that a, they call that a soft defense sometimes, <laughs> right? Like they say that the lawyers were only allowed to present a soft defense. They, they, they could no. be adversarial, but they had to be a little bit careful they didn't offend the Communist Party, uh, right? No. no I have to tell you that so many times I was scolded for saying, <laughs> doing something. But I say, all with my, my defense, it's in the law, I can say everything I you. want, okay? That takes a lot of courage. That's exactly what I'm here, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of courage. It took. Uh, I'm sure. And, and believe me, there are many, uh, many people, uh, there are many lawyers in Cuba that took that route, and of course, many are out now. But there is a, con uh, there is a conscience that we do. Sure. A lot of more based on, on the law and the, uh, the principle of the law that we are educating in, in the law school. That's I, I think, you know, agreeing with kind of both of you, but it goes back to the de facto versus de jure nature of, of the right. system. And, and you have a system in place that would work if it was allowed to work <laughs> the way it's supposed to work. Um, so I think it's going, like, making sure that that, is, that gap is bridged. And one of the things uh, I would like to uh, say uh, um, in uh, international community perspective, if Cuba is one of the eight countries that have ratified the 1966 uh, Social and Civil P uh, Pact, which is uh, a follow-up of the uh, Declaration of the Human Rights. If and we, I think one of the things that we can to uh, strange is that. Senator, I don't want uh, to correct you, but my I'm sorry. feeling is that Cuban Minister for Affairs, Felipe Roque, signed uh, both uh, pacts. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the ratification correct. process has never been terminated. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, you need to apply the Vienna Convention uh, <laughs> on Law of Nations. So. Cuba, uh, if Cuban government is not ready to announce that they want to stop and get out uh, from that uh, process, uh, they have to uh, fulfill uh, the obligations stemming out from these uh, uh, pacts uh, in good faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, uh, 
uh, also principal uh, Pakta Sun Servanda and legitimate expectations, all other members of the international community now have a right to expect from Cuba after the government officially signed uh, <laughs> these uh, conventions that uh, the, pr uh, the spirit of these conventions will be upheld or respected. And exactly. The truth is that it opposite is true, uh, not that. Uh, look, uh, we are getting to the end of this uh, interesting session. Uh, when I was uh, participating in Daniel Pedreda's uh, defense of his thesis, uh, it, as a Central European, I found quite bizarre one thing. Uh, the democratic constitution uh, that Cubans can talk about uh, was uh, came to power in 1940. In the year, in the middle of uh, the war uh, in Europe, in the situation when totalitarianism was on the rise and uh, uh, international community uh, was uh, very much busy with uh, this situation. And Cuba, uh, like an insular country, uh, looked like being almost isolated uh, from all of that. But then uh, you also know very well, because you wrote a beautiful book about Ambassador Guillermo Belt, uh, who was uh, before uh, Batista got things under uh, his control, uh, uh, great representative uh, of Cuba in the context of international community, both United Nations and uh, World Trade Organization, or a different name in that moment. Uh, so. I believe that within this Cuban legal discussion, we should also restore the place of Cuba internationally. Because if you want to think about political strategies, um, internationalization of Cuban struggle is extremely important thing. So how can legal discussion uh, um, uh, bring us uh, forward uh, uh, with this basic goal? I think there is two instruments in international that allow us to in, in, uh, internalize, okay, globalize, if you want to say, Cuban uh, question. One is uh, embargo laws in the United States, and the other one is the, the cooperation, uh, the provisional cooperation uh, pack or agreement with, with Cuba European, in, in oh, European yeah. agreement. If we use those tools, our disposal together, European and the United States, we can influx a lot <coughs> within uh, the Cuban region in Cuba, especially um, uh, the, the implementation of this provisional uh, agreement with the European Union should be conditioned to the fact that the Cuban, for example, should uh, ratify this pact that we're talking about a little bit before, and that also allow the civil society organization free assembly <laughs> to participate in the discussion of the human rights uh, problem that are in Cuba. That's an example. The other thing is the remittances to, from the United States to Cuba that to be in, con in conform with the law principally of the Florida does not allow a charge over 18% of any remittance and otherwise would be considered usury. Same thing in, uh, for, in, for instance, in New Jersey. That's the reason that I've been estranged <coughs> myself as a part of the Cuba demanda with legislators in, in the United States, especially Senator uh, Bob Menendez, who is the architect of the policy uh, uh, regarding Cuba. But actually nothing has happened to that regard. Gentlemen, last word, Daniel. Anything? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, I guess, close this with uh, some <coughs> words of wisdom from my own grandfather who uh, almost lived to see the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Really? He had told my father, I think as early as uh, the 1950s or 60s, that uh, we would see the end of the Soviet Union by the end of the 20th century. And the reason he said that was you can never keep an educated mass of people enslaved. And I really do believe that we are going to see a free Cuba. I'm not just saying that. I'm very convinced of it. I think the regime is crumbling, mm -hmm. and I think it's only a matter of time. And there are tools in the Libertad Act that should Cuba have certain stipulations, that should they start to move toward a democratic transition, the United States will invest in help. And of course, that's a project you're working on here with Marcel Philippe with ideas. I do think we're going to get to that stage. I'm very confident of it. 
and I'm inspired about it, and I'm just grateful that we have a lot of uh, courageous dissidents and opposition leaders on the ground that are going to help us get there. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was very important. We have tools. <laughs> no, just to conclude, I, I mean, I agree with what both, um, both have said, um, and, and I, th I think that I'm a little bit more optimistic in, in terms of the trans not the transition, but the kind of the collapse being closer than we thought it would sure. be. Um, whether that's days, months, years, you know, we don't know, but, but I think it's closer. We've seen things that we haven't seen in the past year. Um, so I think it's, it's promising and it's just good to have these conversations now rather than later. Yeah. Um, so thank so, you. So uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody, people who have had patience uh, uh, or any positive motivation to follow us and think about the arguments that uh, we have tried to articulate. So this is not the uh, last uh, opportunity, I hope, to have uh, this discussion. This discussion is important. And what I would like to say as a final point is uh, I think what is most important is education. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is the willingness of ourselves uh, to educate ourselves, uh, to be open to the ideas, because uh, without that um, tool or instrument uh, that each of us uh, needs to have and cultivate, we easily can fall into all sorts of traps of ignorance, uh, and ignorance is the most uh, effective uh, instrument of totalitarian regimes, uh, and uh, certainly uh, this is something what we need to break and um, uh, uh, change uh, the rules of the game. Uh, and old Socratic wisdom is that each of us uh, is responsible for educating him or herself. Uh, and uh, let's uh, end with uh, that uh, in this spirit. Uh, I hope that Cuba's freedom is not uh, too much far away, but it needs a resolution, it needs commitment and open mind. So thank you very much, and hopefully uh, on the next occasion we will, co uh, we will go on with this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.